my name is Leroy Bupp. Uh, I've farmed here since 1963. We're in York County, Pennsylvania. We're in the Susquehanna Watershed Basin. It runs into the Chesapeake Bay. I'm part of Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance, and our mission is to introduce and help with no-till, which is very helpful in soil health. And today we're here to talk about soil. Uh, soil is one of our most basic parts of life. It's the soil that we walk on. It's the soil that grows our food. It's the soil that grows our fiber uh, for our clothes. Uh, soil is one of the most important things in our life. And we're going to talk about how soil works a little bit. Today in all our farm publications and conservation, we hear about soil health and we, it's something we greatly neglected over years and years of farming because we didn't really understand soil health and that's really not very good because soil health is strictly what mother nature made the way mother nature made it to work and all we're doing in soil health is learning to farm in mother nature's image and we'll discuss a little bit of how that works and we'll see some details of how it works. First off, we have some soil here in front of us, uh, conventional soil, which is tilled soil. And we have no-till soil that's been no-tilled for 40 years. And it's a darker color. The 40-year no-till is darker. That's more organic matter and the conventional soil is, uh, is lighter in color and that's because the oxidation burns up all the organic matter. Before we get started, right, we wanna understand the difference between conventional and no-till. This is a disc off my no-till planter. To no-till crops in, we take two of these and put them at a slight V, which opens a slot about a half inch wide to an inch wide, drops the seed in and closes it. Minimum soil disturbance. That's our goal. Uh, Mother Nature did not disturb the soil to grow plants, and that kept the whole soil healthy. And when we talk about soil health, the next thing we need to know is uh, what, what it's in soil to make it healthy. And it's the worms, the bugs, the beetles, the microbes, the bacteria that make it healthy. A lot of the microbes that are in soil to digest the organic matter is the same microbes that are in our stomach to adjust, digest our food. It works the same way. Our soil is alive. It's a part of our living ecosystem, a healthy soil will have as many worms, bugs, beetles to weigh as much as a cow. A really healthy soil will have enough soil life to weigh as much as two cows. So that gives you some idea of what healthy soil is. So if we go back in time a little bit, what happens when we kill the life in the soil and it gets dead? We created the biggest natural a uh, catastrophe in our soil by tilling. Back in the early 30s, we had what's known as the Dust Bowl, everybody knows about. And what caused the Dust Bowl? And it was killing the soil life that caused the soil to be able to be blown. And we'll talk about that a little more as we go. In 1941, a fellow by the name of Edward Faulkner wrote a book called The Plowman's Folly. And in the Plowman's Folly, it was only eight years after the Dust Bowl, but he said Mother Nature did not have to till the soil to plant. Why are we tilling the soil? You can plant crops without tillage and, and save the soil life. And it was a best-selling book in 41, but he got laughed at because how are we going to grow all our food without tillage? Well. Uh, as time we learned we can do that and 
most farmers today do use a no-till planter, but it's primarily an economical move for them, and soil health is kind of comes along with it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this soil that uh, the conventional soil and put it in water and this is my no-till soil and we're going to put it in water and then we'll put conventional soil in water and we're going to watch what happens to it. As we can see as soon as that raindrop hits the conventional soil it's going to flake off and this is what caused the dust bowl. There was no structure to hold our soil together like it does with long-term no-till and as soon as a raindrop hits a conventional soil it's going to run off and that's muddy water and muddy water is no different than a dust storm it's just ours is with water and that was all with wind moving down the line here we have our soil that we're looking at when i talk about the good soil is aggregated soil is made up of three particles sand silt and clay these are representatives of the three different parts of soil in reality sand would be much bigger and clay would be much smaller clay particles are nearly microscopic but these are examples and what what we want to do to get uh, to get the soil to hold together is we want our soil to become aggregated Aggregation means joining together of particles to make bigger particles. And, it, and then we create a lot of air space for the water to soak in and be stored. Uh, and that's what we're after, absorption and retention. We're going to do a little absorption and retention here. We're going to see how if we add water to our storm clouds, and make it rain on this soil and it's the same soil we used over here uh, we're gonna see what happens as we watch it rain on this soil we can see a the, the water does not penetrate the conventional soil and it's going to run off the top cloudy into the bay. We can see in our no-till soil that the water is starting to perk through. Now we have had a slight bit of runoff on the top, but this, if you notice this little spigot down below, that's our underground water. That's what we want. Most of the water has perked through to the underground water, and the underground water is running off as a spring in the bay, down our streams and into the bay, and that's our goal. Do we want a quick runoff into the bay that's muddy? Or do we want a slow, continuous runoff by spring water into our streams that feed the bay? One of the things that greatly help our percolation is our soil life, our bugs, our beetles, our, and especially the fish worms. And this is a night crawler hole that was in a chunk and on top is what called middings. The night crawlers will pile this over top their hole for protection and future food. A night crawler will spend five to seven years in the same hole. If they can, they like not to leave their hole. They like to leave their tail in their hole and just reach out and gather food and that's part of what they do when they pull this middings in on top of their hole. They'll take some of the food down the hole to let bacteria work on it and then they eat it as it's digesting. They like not to leave their holes because 
they can feel but they can't see and if they go away from their hole they'll get lost and might not get back to the hole and they're subject to predators such as birds and people who want to go fishing. In order to understand a little bit more of how this worm operates we're, we're going to talk a little bit about reproduction of a worm and uh, I need two volunteers to come and we'll go on one on the other side of me. You've all seen uh, uh, a worm have that orange band around them. So these two volunteers are worms and we're gonna put an orange band on them. So now our worms are partly complete. They have their orange band and that orange band is a reproductive system. So when a worm gets ready to reproduce, that orange band will get bigger and it will glow. So now we have worms that are ready to reproduce. Worms have, worms have both male and female organs in themselves, but they need to latch up with another worm in order to reproduce. Their latch up may take from five minutes to 45 minutes, time isn't important. And during that period of time, they will fertilize and pass about six to eight eggs. And they form a saliva type solution that when one pulls out and then the other pulls out we have a cocoon left and that cocoon will go in the soil and stay there till spring or fall whenever it's convenient and until they hatch and tillage will destroy the cocoons tillage will destroy the worms as we can see of the water we put in, a lot has been absorbed and retained. What did soak in ran off by springs and it's almost clear. And what didn't perk in the soil unconventional was a quick runoff of muddy water. I got a jar of water here that in, in we had 12 inches of rain on this farm in 2018 in July and um, it was 12 inches in three days and we had nine inches and coming down this driveway here beside us was running clear water and then overnight we had another three inches of water and by morning we still had clear water and this sample is of the runoff from my no-till fields after 12 inches of rain. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. Where we're standing is in a 40 year no-till field with a heavy cover crop. Our cover crops, first off, if we plant a monoculture, one, one cover crop, uh, I can see through it, you can see through it. We're gonna lose a lot of sun rays. If we add mola species to it, we'll gather more sun rays. And if we add a little more, that's pollinators, that, that'll help, plus gather more sun rays. And I talk about sun rays, but that's, uh, we haven't talked about the sunshine yet. Uh, and probably the most important thing we have is Mr. Sunshine. Uh, and the sunshine, has about 1,633 horsepower of energy per acre per year. It takes about 600 horsepower to drive the water cycle, the rain, uh, the evaporation, the rain. And it takes about 400 horsepower to grow our crops. And if we don't have a cover crop, uh, we're wasting the other 600 horsepower. If we got cover crops, 
it will absorb a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in the soil where it makes our soil darker and functions more properly. So Mr. Sunshine is one of our most important things we have. Coming back to this, it's pretty well finished for the moment, but you can see we don't have near as much water. Uh, the, uh, the retention is so much greater because we have those pore spaces. What ran off because it wouldn't percolate is, is very muddy. What we're trying to do is with this soil is create a sponge so that it absorbs that water and don't run it all off at one time. And another thing that's very important in our soil is, is mycorrhizae fungi. And mycorrhizae fungi is a spider-like web connection in the soil that is basically, it's a root extension that connects to the root and connects to water and nutrients that are in the soil and transfers it back to the plant. So mycorrhizae fun fungi is very much a part of our soil health. If we do tillage, it destroys it and it's gone. So we've talked a lot about what makes soil healthy. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how we have destroyed the soil health over the years. We've taken this disc and put a lot of them together at an angle and tilled the soil and turned it into tilly the tillage gremlin. And what does tilly the tillage gremlin do to our soil life? It takes uh, the cocoon that we put our worm eggs in and destroys it. When we do a disc of field, 50% of the worms are destroyed. 80% of the cocoons are killed. We take our mycorrhizae fungi we destroy it, we take our sponge that we've created, we throw it out. We basically take all our soil life and we throw it out. And what do we have? We have soil that flakes apart and, and runs muddy. I've been doing this presentation for a few years. I keep changing it and adding to it. Uh, what I, probably what got me started is I probably no-tilled longer than anybody. I have record going back to 72 that we started no-tilling. I'm trying to pass the message that not disturbing the soil, we can run clean water off our farms. And I'm trying to just get the word out and do our part to help clean up the bay.